us that were on television on NBC in, in, in that time, you know, that whatever we do in the rest of our careers, we'll always be known as being of that time. And, you know, that was Brandon's time. And, uh, and you know, I'm real proud of it. If ever someone was born to do something, Brandon Tartikoff seemed to be the guy making judgments on the medium while still in grade school. I remember when I was like seven or eight years old watching the old Dennis the Menace television show and complaining to my mother about how they had miscast Dennis with, uh, with Jay North. And she sort of looked at me a little perplexed saying, I've got a strange kid. Well, this strange kid grew into a man who was driven by his passion for television. He's just had homework for his whole life, his whole working career. So it's like hours and hours and hours of reading and reading. This is what I used to do. Let's see. That's it. I've had it. That's it. Now talk to me. <laughs> I basically accused him of creating characters that he'd like to be friends with. I think all of television watching is the forming of surrogate friendship. So you feel like Ted Danson on Cheers playing Sam Malone. You sort of have a take about both the character and the actor playing them. Hey, hey, wow, you're drunk. Wow, you're stupid. <laughs> I'll be sober in the morning. Hard to get good help, isn't it? Uh, son, your mother asked me to come up here and kill you. You're out of this Operation Tubbs, as of now. There is no operation without me, Crockett. Go Even back Crockett back and Tubbs and a hit like Miami Vice can have humble beginnings. In this case, it was a piece of scrap paper upon which Brandon had simply scribbled MTV Cops. I also had pieces of paper that said MTV Detective. Um, I also had a piece of paper that said MTV Apartment 3G. I was obsessed with MTV. And when a show like Miami Vice hit it big, for Brandon, there was no better feeling. Like falling in love. I mean, it was sort of like all you could do is, that's all you could think about, that this thing that you had been part of was so wonderful and other people were realizing it was so wonderful. Brandon's schedule, one hit at a time, turned around a network. Well, last May when we all got together, we said we were cautiously optimistic. And when we met with you in January, we amended that to read cautiously aggressive. Now with a second place season behind us, a good May sweeps in the works, I guess the term that best describes us is cautiously wetting our pants. <laughs> and how would he see a show based on the life of a TV dynamo, say the Brandon Tartikoff story? I see it as about a 14 share. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm probably not buying. But when Brandon was on a roll, there weren't too many 14 shares. Uh, first year, uh, Cheers was, I think, 79th or 80th or something like that. We were basically uh, in the toilet, and they stuck with us. And the second year, we were not that much better. I think we were in the 30s or something. And then uh, the Bill Cosby show came along and uh, boosted us into the position that uh, we ended up. But it, if it hadn't been for his patient and the combination of uh, putting us behind Cosby, Cheers really wouldn't have had the success, I, I don't think, that it, uh, that it had. You, Sam Malone, are the most arrogant, self-centered... Shut up! Shut your fat mouth. And make me. Make you. <laughs> make you. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bounce you off every wall in this office! Try it, and you'll be walking funny tomorrow. <laughs> or should I say funnier? You know... You know, I always wanted to pop you one. <laughs> Maybe this is my lucky day, huh? You disgust me. I hate you. Are you as turned on as I am? More. Yeah. <laughs> he, he really stuck by us. I, I, um, he would call me every uh, Saturday morning, because back then the, the, the Nielsen ratings didn't come out, the Nationals didn't come out until Saturday. And he would say, we're up to a 19 or up to a 20, and uh, the press likes us. I think one of the great things Brandon didn't do was meddle. 
he let us do our own shows, and he had a gift for that. I miss him. Sorry, we're closed. Cheers was a part of his legacy. An apartment in Manhattan will run you at least $400 a month. I'll live in New Jersey. <laughs> All right. To live in New Jersey, you've got to have a car. I'll ride a motorbike. <laughs> You need a helmet. The free love generation was now settling down and having kids, and I thought everybody was now into parenting. And what better person to tell us about parenting and parenting lessons than, than Bill Cosby? That was his whole image. I got everything I need, plus $200 left for the month. You plan to have a girlfriend? For sure. <laughs> There was a time when people said that comedy was dead. And Brandt had said it isn't dead. And he put Bill Cosby on the air and proved all the naysayers wrong. Let's have a big hand for Brandon Tartikoff. And along came this little family comedy, The Cosby Show. And it transformed NBC and it put comedy back on the map. And it was a time really before Cosby where we didn't have confidence in ourselves. Brandon questioned whether, whether he really had it. And when that show hit, everything started to come together. Your chicken making all that noise? Oh, Jerry loves the morning. Oh, little Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, I need my chicken after you. Thanks, that's very sweet, but that is not a chicken. Of course it is. I picked it out myself. Well, you picked out a rooster. Well, that would explain little Jerry's poor egg production. <laughs> he used to say to me that it's, it's, too, it's too New York, it's too Jewish. And I said, well... What am I supposed to do? <laughs> I said, even if people are, are prejudiced, I think they will accept me for entertainment purposes. What does she look like? I don't know. Hard to say. What actress uh, does she remind you of? Lonnie Anderson. <laughs> Lonnie Anderson?